Okay, today's lesson is factoring quadratic expressions. And um, we did talk about, just to make sure that everybody remembers, what um, factoring means, okay? And a factor we talked about is a number that goes into another number evenly with no remainder. Or you could also think of it as um, a factor is one of two numbers um, that multiply together to give you a product, okay? So I have in this le lesson attempted to group our factoring into four main types. And we're going to go through and do lots of examples. So I hope that you will come see me if you have any kind of questions or email me. Okay, so the first type that we have that I'm going to start with um, is those types of factoring problems called GCF. And everybody is familiar with GCF stands for greatest common factor. And um, it is it should always be and say always. It should always be the first step when you factor. Okay? So we did talk about the fact that a GCF could be numbers and or it could be variables. So when we looked at this first problem, um, 6z cubed plus 4z squared, then the largest number that went into both of those was 2. And we started doing like this because I had more success with people um, getting this process correct when they write the factor underneath it. So 2 goes into both of those, and they both have a z. And when they both have a variable, and you're wondering which exponent you are supposed to use, it's always going to be the lowest exponent that will be your greatest factor. Now, I said lowest because obviously we only have 2. It would be lower, but if we had more than 2, then it would be lowest. So I know you didn't think you'd get a grammar lesson in here, but sorry, can't help it. Okay, so 2z squared, 2z squared. And whatever you write down here to divide is the number that's going to be our GCF. And so that has to be outside. And then you go back to each term, and now we divide. 6 divided by 2 is 3. Z cubed over Z squared is Z. Um, and if you have any trouble with that concept, remember when you divide with exponents, we subtract them. So 3 minus 2 is 1, which is why I'm left with 3Z. And then that sign carries forward. 4 divided by 2 is 2. And z squared over z squared, that's the same thing. So that's going to even out and be just um, 2. Okay, look at the next one. It says 3a cubed minus 6a. The largest common factor number is 3. And they both have an A in them, but that exponent is a 1. Even though we don't write it, it's a 1. So that would be your greatest common factor, and that would be the one that's going to be on the outside. My 3's will cancel. 3 divided by 3 is 1. A cubed over A is A squared. Carry forth my minus, and 6 divided by 3 is 2. And I certainly didn't realize that I had somebody ask. It's not always going to be a 2. So just keep watching, and um, we'll keep going. Okay, moving down, 8x cubed minus 8x squared, GCF is 8x, and the lower exponent here is 2, so it's 8x squared. That's my GCF, so that gets written out front. And then my 8s are the same, and then x to the third over x squared leaves me with x. Now, this is where people get caught up. Because if you don't do it like this, this is where I find people think, oh, it's just an X. But we started with two terms. And so whatever many terms we start with, that's how many terms have to be inside your parentheses. So again, I carry the minus, and anything divided by itself is 1. So that's why this is 8X squared times the quantity of X minus 1. All right, next, 5K squared plus 7K cubed. Um, there is no number that goes into 5 and 7, but they both do have a k. And the lower exponent would be squared, so we have k squared. And that's what we will write out front. 
and that leaves me with 5, no more k's left, minus 7k. Now, the other thing that we talked about was how to know that you're doing these correct, correctly, excuse me, um, and you would know because you could check your answer by multiplying these out, redistributing, some people said, okay? Um, however, a lot of people don't want to do that, which is why um, I am always wanting people to go practice in IXL. So I'm going to give you the IXL reference for each of these topics. So this one has an IXL reference in Algebra 1, and that's okay. Algebra 1 is AA.1 and AA.2. And in Algebra 2, you will find it in I.1. Okay, so you'll always have that. If you need to go practice a specific group, you can know where you need to go. All right, so let's keep going. Um, all right, so I have 8xy plus 4y squared, and my GCF is 4xy. So that, of course, is what gets written out front. And what's left on the first one is 2. My variables are the same on the top and bottom, so they cancel. And then uh, my 4's cancel, my X's cancel, and I'm left with just one Y. So we are good to go there. All right, looking at our next one. And one thing to do, if you're catching on, okay, see if you can pause it and figure out what that GCF is before I write it down. Okay, so my students actually could give it to me faster than I could write. But this one, 5AB squared C squared, happens to be our GCF. So 5AB squared C squared will be written out front. When I simplify this first term, I have a 4. My A's are gone. I have 1B left on top. And I have 2C's left on top. And I have a D. Minus... This is exactly the same on the top and bottom, so I'm going to write a 1. Okay? <clears throat> Next, we have, um, and, and one of the other things to keep in mind in this, I gave a lot of examples on GCF because I tell you, the teachers, we think the GCF is the easiest one to do, but a lot of times that's some reason it trips the students up. So hopefully having lots of examples of this will make it easy for you to do better in the future. Okay, so the largest number that goes into each of these is 3. They all have a W. Lowest exponent is a 1. And they all have a T, and the lowest exponent is 2. So that is my GCF, 3WT squared. What's left on the first one is 4W squared, it looks like. Is it 4? Yep, 4w squared, and then on the next one, I have just minus 3. And on the next one, I'm going to have plus 5, and then I have 1w and 1t. Okay. Ooh, I did not mean to do that. All right, moving on. Um, 36 into the 5th, and 40 and 160, and the largest number that goes into those, I don't know why it's doing that, is 4, and they all have an n, and the lowest exponent is n squared. So again, that's what I'm going to write out front, 4n squared, and 36 divided by 4 is 9, and I have 3n's left after I subtract those exponents. 4 goes into 40. 10 times. I have two n's left after I subtract those exponents. 160 divided by 4 is 40 n, and 20 divided by 4 is 5, and I have the same number on the top and the bottom. So we are good. All right, moving on to our second group. The second group is one that's called special cases, and this is kind of one of those ones why uh, that prompted me to divide these up. Because I happen to think that these two cases, special cases of factoring, are one of the most important. We use them a lot. Your life will be so much easier if you get them down and understand what they are. 
So, and in IXL, they don't have a separate category in Algebra 1, uh, excuse me, in Algebra 2. They only do in Algebra 1. So that's where we have to go to just get these down and get them practiced. Now, I'm going to go through and just apply the rule to these. If you want to know more, if you have any questions of why the rule is what it is, please come see me or email me. I'll be happy to demonstrate that for you. So, first off, as you can see by these names here, they are both going to deal with squares. Okay? So, it's important for you to know what the perfect squares are. And when I'm talking about that, I mean a number that's a perfect square. So, there was one in every class who could tell me, usually more than one, but the point is, I think most of y'all know, a square is a number that you get when you multiply a number by itself. 1 times 1 is 1 squared. 1 squared is 1. 2 squared is 4. 3 squared is 9. 4 squared is 16. 5 squared is 25. 6 squared is 36. 7 squared is 49. 8 squared is 64. 9 squared is 81. 10 squared is 100. 11 squared is 121. I'm trying to make it fit. Um, 11, 12. 12 squared is 144. 13 squared is 169. 14 squared is 196. And 15 squared is 225. And I made it. Okay, so these numbers need to become very recognizable to you as perfect squares. Okay? And, so the first one we're going to talk about is a perfect square trinomial. How many parts are in that? Tri means three. So a perfect square trinomial looks like this. The first term is a perfect square. The last term is a perfect square. And the inside term is what you get when you take those square roots, multiply them together, and times two. Now, you don't necessarily need to remember all that. I'm going to tell you how to get recognize it, okay? But it always factors to the square root of the first term and the square root of the second term, uh, excuse me, square root of the last term and the sign of the second term. So you're getting something from every term. You get the square root of that, you get this sign from the middle term, and you get the square root of that. Now, sometimes, the only thing that might be different is sometimes this will be a minus sign. And if that's a minus sign, this is a minus sign. But other than that, it's always going to look like that. So let's go back and um, do some of these. And actually, I'm going to do these, and then I'm going to come back and do the difference of two squares. So let's talk about these first. First off, is there a greatest common factor? There is not a number that goes into everything or a variable in each of them. So we're good with the GCF. Then, is this a perfect square? And you say yes, but and, and you won't see anything different now, but just in the future, we'll see it again. But you know that a variable is a perfect square if this number right here, if that exponent is even, because you're going to find the square root by dividing it by 2. So, yes, if it's squared, it is, but if it could be to the 4th power, 6th power, 8th power, anything. Okay, so that's a perfect square. 49 is a perfect square. So, as I said, take the square root of g squared the square root of 49, and it's going to take the sign of the second term. Now, what's really important is that you check it, because then you'll know that you truly have a PST. So what you do, g times 7 is 7g, and if you take that, 7g times 2 is 14g. So we know that we have the right answer. Okay, look at this next one. Is there a GCF here? No GCF. Is this a perfect square? Yes. Is this a perfect square? Yes, it is. So that means I'm going to set, take the square root of 4D squared, which is 2D, and the square root of 25, which is 5, and I'm going to take the sign of that second term. And then to check it, 5 times 2D is 10D, and 10D times 2 is 20D. So we know that we've got it. All right, one more of these. Ah, <laughs> dropped my pen, sorry. Um, 18K squared. So the first thing, again, we look for a GCF, and yeah, we do have a GCF. 
So that GCF is two. Oh, and by the way, if you got a note sheet from me yesterday, that 84, I think, was 24. So a typo on my part. I apologize for that. But um, if you're printing it off the calendar, then you should be good to go because I fixed it. So uh, 18K squared. These all have a common factor of two, so I'm going to take it out. And when I do, obviously that's going to give me 9K squared minus 42KP. I need to come up a little bit, extend my page. There we go. Um, plus 49P squared. And now that is a perfect square, and this is a perfect square. So I'm going to carry my 2. The square root of 9K squared is 3K minus from my second term, and then square root of 49P squared is 7P. And we check it. 3K times 7P is 21KP times 2 is 42KP. So we're good. All right, so those are your perfect square trinomials, or PSTs. Now, let's talk about the difference of two squares. So trinomials are starting with three terms. Difference of two squares means I'm going to have two squares. And difference means that they're going to be subtracted. If they're not subtracted, you can't do anything with it. But they will always factor to A plus B. A minus B. Now, in case you're watching this again and I did it a little bit differently from class, um, does it matter which of these you write first? And the answer is no, because 2 times 3 is the same as 3 times 2. So when I'm multiplying those factors, it does not matter. Okay? So, first and foremost, do they have a common factor? No, they do not. So, uh, but that is a perfect square, and this is a perfect square, so that's going to give me square root of 4h squared is 2h. The square root of 9 is 3. And I know that one of them has to be minus, and one of them has to be plus. And that's all you got to do. Okay, look at the next one. Let's go to a different one here. Let's go here. Uh, all right, so 2 minus 18x squared. Well, that's not a perfect square, but of course, what were we supposed to look for first? the GCF. So if I take a 2 out, I'm left with 1 minus 9x squared. Now I have two perfect squares. So I'm going to write my 2. The square root of 1 is 1, and the square root of 9x squared is 3x. So 1 minus 3x, 1 plus 3x. Don't forget that 2. All right, last one. And I'm going to uh, have to pause, but I'll be back. Um, so this one here, a lot of people said, oh, well, that's a perfect square, and that's a perfect square. So they didn't look for the GCF first, so I'm going to do it both ways so you can see what happens if you forget to get the GCF first. So 196, perfect square, square root of that is 14. So we would have 14M, square root of 144 is 12. 14m minus 12, 14m plus 12. But your directions are always going to say factor completely. And that's not complete because they both have a common factor. This has a common factor of 2. And this has a common factor of 2. And then if these are all multiplied together, then 2 times 2 is 4. And then I would end up with this. And this would be the completely factored form. Had you seen the GCF first, you would write a 4, and when you factored a 4 out of here, you would have 49m squared, and 144 divided by 4 is 36, and then you would get to that step. So either way, it does not really matter which way you do it. This way took a few more steps, okay? All right, so um, I've got to find my cord because my battery is dying. So, um, let's see how I can pause for one second. Okay, well, fortunately, you don't know how long that break was, but I answered emails and texts and found my power cord, and now we're going to keep going. So, the next group that we have is the group called grouping.
And grouping, you want to always think about grouping when you see four terms, okay? Because it's not going to fit into any of the other things that we that we're talking about in here. So when you have four or more terms, but four terms specifically, you're going to group them more times than not into pairs and then find the GCF and then you will proceed as you have done previously. So look at this first one. We have, um, so my two pairs, four terms, there's a pair and there's a pair. And I like to circle this because that's the one that's going to be carried down in between our pairs. So when I look at this pair, what is the GCF between those two terms? It is, in this case, u squared. And what do I have left would be 2u minus 1. Then I carry down my negative. And then I'm going to look at uh, the GCF here, which is 8. And then what I did is I'm telling you to write this one down because everybody in all of my classes, not everybody, but there was people, there were people in all of my classes who wanted to make this factor 2u plus 1. And the reason that I'm telling you that it just need to write this one down, because if these two are not exactly the same, then you can go no further in this problem. That's one thing. Number two is if you figure out the GCF, then you can check it. Negative 8 minus 2u is negative 16u. Negative 8 times negative 1 is positive 8. So had you put a plus 1 here, you would have negative 8 times positive 1, which is not positive 8. So I'm telling you that you're on the right track. If it's nothing close to that, okay, then you didn't find the GCF. But save yourself some trouble and then multiply it out. So now these two are in common. Okay, which, so this is a common factor that is in both of them. And go back to my pen. And so when I pull that out, 2u minus 1, well, what's left in this first one is u squared. And what's left in the second one is minus 8. So now we are done. Okay, look at this next one. All right, four terms. I'm going to group them in two pairs. I circle that middle term because that's what I'm going to carry down. So the GCF here is z squared. And what's left is z minus 1. Carry down my plus sign. What is in common here is 6. And then I'm going to carry down, I'm going to write z minus 1. And if I'm really good, I'll check it. 6z minus 6, which is what that says. And now here is my common factor. So z minus 1. And what's left there is z squared plus 6. Or if you think about, you know, my little squiggly, what's not squiggly is what's in that second factor. If that was even English at all. Okay, so again, one more. Group in two pairs. Circle that middle sign because we're going to carry that down. The GCF with these two is 4x, leaving me with 3y plus 7. Carry down my minus sign. The GCF here is 5. And again, 3y plus 7. And I know that's hard for you, but we're factoring out a negative, and that's why that sign changes. Um, these are the same. And so 3y plus 7 was that GCF right here. And what I'm left with is 4x minus 5. Well, I don't know why that moved. That was weird. Okay, moved it back. All right, so, oh, i got to give you the IXL reference here. Okay, so in IXL, grouping in Algebra 1, it is AA.7. And in Algebra 2, it is I.5. All right, now, this last group which is another one that we see a lot of, okay? We see, so between group two and group four, those are going to be the most frequent. Group two should be really easy because it's the same thing every time. This one takes a little more work, okay? So, first off, let me give you that IXL reference so I don't forget. In Algebra 1, in Algebra 1, they're going to break it up into two different types. So that was kind of... Um, 
what I was assigning for so you could kind of see the difference between the two of those. And I'll talk about that in just a second. In Algebra 2, they're all grouped together. So that's kind of why I'm teaching it this way, because it's all grouped together, and you kind of got to get used to how you're going to see it. Okay, first and foremost, when we're talking about a trinomial, we're talking about three terms, ax squared plus bx plus c. And that's different from the PST because these two are not both perfect squares. Okay, now, when you look at a trinomial, and you're going to see when we do this, you first thing that you want to think about is are you looking for a sum or a difference? And how do you know what you're looking for? Is C positive or is C, that's not going to be the right way, or is C negative? All right, so you're going to decide, and again, you're going to see we'll do lots of examples of these. Sum or difference, find the factors, after you figure that out, you're going to find the factors of A times C, that's these two things here, and you're going to find the factors of that product that give you a sum or a difference equal to B. Okay? And then we're either going to use ratios, so you can either do this, or you can break it up, break up the linear term, which is BX, and then factor by grouping. So on this video, I'm actually going to do it both ways for all of them, so that because I've had people in the past, I've done the grouping, people like the grouping, people can always do the grouping, but some people are frustrated that I didn't show them this other method that's a little bit shorter. So uh, I'm going to do both of them. I apologize if you have to watch through it, but um, you know, you can stop. If you got the hang of it, just stop and go on. All right, so let's go here. So the first thing, are you looking for a sum or a difference? And that depends on C. C is negative, so I'm looking for a difference. Okay, so I'm looking for a difference. Now I have to find the factors of A times C. All right, A is the number in front. C is the one at the end, written in standard form. So A times C is 15, and we'll say negative 15. Make people happy, okay? It doesn't really matter, but anyway. So I'm looking for the factors of 15, which are 1 and 15, and 3 and 5. Now, obviously, because it's negative 16, I mean, excuse me, negative 15, go away. Because it's negative 15, I have no idea what, okay, there we go. Um, because it's negative 15, one of those is going to be negative. But how are we going to figure it out? We're looking for the factors of that product that have a sum equal to this middle term. This is my B. That was A, B, and C. So I need to subtract these numbers to get to 2. Well, these are the ones that are going to give me 2, and if I want the 2 to be negative, then I need my 5 to be negative, because that's the bigger number. 3 plus negative 5 is going to be negative 2, or 3 minus 5 is negative 2, however you wish to think about it. Okay, so now I'm going to do the longer one first. Break up the linear term and then factor by grouping. So when we mean break up this linear term, okay, it's going to be like this. It's going to be 3p squared plus, it's a positive 3, so it's plus 3p minus 5p minus 5. Now, you might have a question and wonder, does it matter of the order of these two? It does not, okay? So, now we'll continue, and as it said, so break up the linear term, we broke up the linear term, and now we're going to factor by grouping, which means that, I think I've lost my pen, but maybe not. Oh, I know what's going on. All right, so that means that I group those first two. What do they have in common? 3p. What's left? p plus 1. Always carry down that sign. What do these two have in common? 5. Break it up. p, I mean, excuse me, factor it out, you get p plus 1, which is the same thing I have there. So that's my common factor. And so p plus 1 times 3p minus 5 is how this thing factors. Okay? You're like, whoa. All right, let's do another one. Okay? Um, all right. So I'm looking at this one. And c squared minus ac plus 15. 
I look at C. I'm looking for a sum. So I'm going to add these factors. And funny enough, 15 times 1 is 15, which is the same thing we had right there. So I can write down those same factors, 1, 15, 3, and 5. Certainly didn't plan it that way. Now, I will tell you, when you have a difference, your signs down here in your answer will always be different. When you have a sum, they will always be the same. So it's an easy thing to check your signs. Okay, this is negative 8. So to get negative 8, both of these have to be negative. So when I break this up, I'm going to have c squared minus 3c minus 5c plus 15. Again, the order that you write those in does not matter. And now I have four terms, and I'm going to pair them. The GCF here is C, leaving me with C minus 3. Carry down that sign in between them. GCF is 5, leaving me with, I'm going to write C minus 3, because that's the same thing as here. And if you check that, negative 5 times negative 3 is a positive 15. And now C minus 3 is my common factor. And C minus 5, it's what's left. Okay? Um, I'm going to go ahead and do these last two on this um, grouping here, and then I'm going to come back and talk about the ratios. Um, okay, so uh, let's go with this. So, first thing I do, am I looking for a sum or a difference? I'm looking for a difference, which means my signs will have to be different in my answer. And now I multiply A times C. C, sorry. So 3 times 4, I didn't want to do that. 3 times 4 is 12. And the factors of 12 are 1 and 12, 2 and 6, 3 and 4. I need to, uh, well, look at that. Y'all must think I'm loony. Okay, that says plus. That does not mean it's going to be a difference. That means it's going to be a sum. I apologize for that. Um, you can stop yelling at me now. Um, it's a sum, so I'm going to add these numbers to get to negative 8. Well, 6 and 2 give me negative 8. And since it's negative, they're both got to be negative. So when I break this guy up, it's going to be 3y squared um, minus 2y minus 6y plus 4. Okay, and now I do my grouping, and what do these have in common? Only a y, leaving me with 3y minus 2. What do these have in common? Um, a 2, leaving me with 3y, and I want to write a plus, but this one says minus, so I'm going to do minus. And then I know negative 2 times negative 2 is positive 4, so we're good. Common factor is 3y minus 2. And y minus 2 is what's left. Okay, one more of these, and then I'm going to tell you how to do the ratios with it. All right, so again, here, what if they're all sums? Got a sum. But the nice thing about this, and you'll soon begin to appreciate prime numbers, 13 is prime. So the only factors you have are 1 and 13. Okay, and fortunately, they add up to 14. So that means when I break this up, w squared plus 1w plus 13w plus 13. And now I pair them. What do these have in common? w left with w plus 1. What do these have in common? 13 leaving me with w plus 1. And now, this is what I have in common. And so, I'm going to write W plus 1, and I'm left with W plus 13. Okay, so that was doing the um, breaking up and factoring by grouping. So let me talk a little bit about the ratios. And what you do with the ratio method is once you find, I'm trying to find a different color here to do this, okay? Once you find your factors here, you've got to do the same step on number two. 
But once you find your factors, actually I'm going to go below it. Okay? Let's see if I have room here. So my factors are 3 and negative 5. So once I find 3 and negative 5, when you do your ratios, you're going to make a ratio using A. So you're going to divide both of those factors by A. And what is A in this problem? It's 3. So when I divide that by 3 and that by 3. Now, does that simplify? No, it does not. Does this simplify? Yes, it does. It becomes 1 over 1. I would not write 1 in this case because what's going to happen next is Mm, let's go with, um, I don't know if y'all can see that, we'll find out. When you have these pairs, then this guy is going to go, I don't like that, sorry, I have to go back to this, okay? This guy is going to go in front, and I actually draw this arrow to help me remember. So this is a visual. So if you look at this, if you put the 3 over here, this factor is 3p minus 5, 3p minus 5. This is 1p plus 1. That's exactly what that factor is. So you could jump from here, write down your ratios, and then get your factors. Okay? Look at this one if I did the same thing. My factors were 1 and 15. Nope, excuse me, they were not. I lied. They were this right here. Those were my factors. I didn't circle them, so I was having a hard time. So it was negative 3 and negative 5. Well, what's A in this case? It's 1. So, 1C minus 3, 1C minus 3, 1C minus 5, 1C minus 5. Okay? My factors here are negative 2 and 6. So, negative 2 and negative 6. What is my A? A is 3. All right, this guy simplifies to negative 2 over 1. And so when you draw your arrow, 3y minus 2 is right there. Draw your arrow here, 1y minus 2 is right there. Okay? And um, let's do that one. So 13, again, my factors were 13 and 1. So I have 1 and 13. My a value is 1. But more importantly, okay, really, y'all? I'm clearly having trouble paying attention because y'all aren't in the classroom yelling at me right now. That was supposed to be a 13. Apologies. Okay. So, but notice, if A is 1, y'all, these directly are your factors. There's the 1 and there's the 13. So it's even easier. And that is what the difference in these two IXLs are. This is A is equal to 1, and this is A not equal to 1. All right, but I wanted to go back to the Algebra 1 level so we could get that down. But in, in Algebra 2, they're not going to give you that distinguish, distinguish, distinguishable factor. So you've got to decide that for yourself. Okay, so I did a lot of these by grouping, and I think you should have that down by now. So let's go do these by just the ratio method and see what happens, okay? So, um, oh, excuse me one second. I need to pause. Okay, I'm back for the final four. Okay, so as I said, we're gonna we did the grouping, and this time we're gonna try to do it just with the ratio method for those of y'all who want to see just the ratio method. So what I would do again, well, I don't have a pen to write. Uh, this right here is negative, so that means I'm looking for a difference of my factors. I multiply A times C, which of course is 24. Okay, stop moving on me. A times C is 24, and our, my factors of 4 are 1 and 24, 2, 12, 3, 8, 4, and 6. All right, I'm looking for those factors to subtract to give me 2. Well, here's right here. Those subtract to give me 2. Is it 4 minus 6 or 6 minus 4? Well, if I need a positive 2, then it's 6 minus 4. So then I write my two factors, negative 4 and 6, and my ratio, my A value is 1. Well, if my A value is 1, there are my factors right there. So that's K minus 4, 
and k plus 6. Okay? All right, let's look at this next one. Um, again, I have c is positive, so that means I'm looking for a sum. And I'm going to do a times c, which is 10. And now I'm looking for the factors of 10, which are 1 and 10, 2 and 5, and that's all there are. Okay? So then uh, I need to add to get 7. So there's adding to get 7. So my factors are 2 and 5. And I divide by a. What's my a value? My a value is 2. And 5 over 2 does not simplify. No common factors. But 2 over 2 becomes 1 over 1. And then these are my factors. So that's going to be 1f plus 1 and 2f plus 5. And there you have it. Again, let me emphasize, if you're finding a difference, these signs have to be different. If you're finding a sum, they will be the same. Okay? So sometimes finding out a factored form means I just got to pay attention to those signs. Okay? All right. Let's go to two more, and then we are done with our video. Okay. So uh, I'm looking for a sum. No, I did different funny. All right, factors of 24 times 1, so that's 24. And notice I've already written them down here, but I'll write them again. Again, But sometimes you don't have to keep writing. You can just, and actually, let's act like exactly we did this. I already have them over here, y'all. So I'm looking for the numbers that add to give me 5. And I'm telling you that a lot of people are going to go, oh, 3 and 8. But 3 and 8 don't add to give you 5. They subtract to give you 5. So can I add any of these numbers and get 5? And the answer is no. So this particular problem is prime. And when I give you a problem, if it can't be factored, then you would give me prime. IXL wants you to give, you, give it back to you. You just need to read the directions on what they say. Okay? So that was a nice one near the end when we're getting tired and want to go home. Okay, last one. Um, I'm looking for a sum. I'm multiplying a times c together. Funny enough, okay, it's 10, okay, and again, I have those factors already written down there, so I need to find two factors that add to give me 11. Well, that's 1 and 10. And then I divide by my a value, which is 2. Well, 10 over 2, of course, becomes 5. Okay, stop it. 5 over 1. And then I draw my little arrow to help me remember which one goes first. So my factor is going to be 2v plus 1 and v plus 5. And, of course, we talked about it. You can always check these by multiplying them back out. Back out. But, um, anyway, I hope that was very helpful to you. One more thing that I want to point out that you can print off is... Um, at the end of these and on the calendar. But this is a little flow chart that reminds you of all the things that we've talked about. How to factor polynomials. First find that GCF with your numbers or your variables. And then depending on how many terms, okay, if you have two terms, we're looking for the difference of two squares. If you have three terms, you're looking for whether or not it's a PST or not. And four terms is when we group. And if you have three terms, if it's a PST, there's your pattern right there that we've talked about. And if it's not a PST, then we just went through the steps of using your ratios or breaking up that linear term by grouping. So I hope this helps, and I hope that you don't think factoring is just the worst thing in the world and um, that we can be successful moving forward. But please email me or come see me if you have any questions. Thank you very much.